Today we're going to consider the first nine verses of Mark chapter 8. Please follow along in your Bible as I read aloud. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. The divers of them came from far. And his disciple answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break, and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. They had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000. And he sent them away. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now for these next few moments, that you would help us to understand the text of Scripture before us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that by the gracious work of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to see your Son, Jesus Christ, for that is who we need to see today. Lord, please bless the preaching of your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Now, there is a good chance that you have never heard a sermon in a church service on this text. And if you have, my guess is that you have heard at least five times as many sermons on the other miracle in the Gospels that is very much like this one, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000 is the story that gets taught in Sunday school, and it's very appropriate given the role that the young lad plays. Most, if not all of us, know about his five loaves and two fishes. By comparison, I would imagine this miracle has featured in nowhere near as many Sunday school lessons over the years. And maybe you've wondered about it. Why did Mark record this miracle given it is so like the other one? <laughs> did he need to hit a word count? <laughs> and so he decided to put this in. Does that explain it? In case his readers missed the message in the first miracle, he thought he'd better include the account of this miracle. Was that it? Besides the number of people, the number of loaves and the number of leftovers, was there something different about this miracle? Something Mark wanted his readers to notice. Why do we have an account of this miracle in the Gospel according to Mark and in the Gospel according to Matthew? The story is worth considering by itself on its own merits, and we're going to do that this morning, but there is something about the context that we are supposed to notice, something that makes this miracle even more significant. Where was Jesus when he fed these 4,000 people? The answer to that is given at the end of chapter 7. And remember, there were no chapter divisions in Mark's original manuscript. Uh, chapter divisions were not added to copies of the New Testament until the 13th century. So Mark, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing one continuous account of the life and ministry of Jesus, and he's making decisions about what to include. And look back, please, to chapter 7, verse 31 and following. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. And again, departing from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coasts of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. 
And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much more a great deal they published it. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Now chapter 8, verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them. In those days, verse 1 says. In those days. Well, what days? The days when Jesus was in the coasts or the borders of Decapolis. A natural reading of the text indicates that at this time Jesus was in the area known as Decapolis. The word literally means ten cities. This was a region on the southeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. This region was not part of the Tetrarchy governed by Herod Antipas, nor was it part of Judea. These ten cities were small, autonomous city-states under Roman protection. They were built in the Roman style and they issued their own coins. Each city had the kinds of public buildings that you would have found in any city around the Roman Empire. Uh, Each probably had a theatre and baths. They all had temples to various deities. The temple associated with the cult of the emperor was probably the most prominent and the worship of the emperor was probably what united these ten cities. Now, these were Roman cities characterised by Greek culture and each city controlled the territory that immediately surrounded it. Now, there were Jewish people who lived in this region, but it was predominantly populated by Gentiles, by pagans. You might remember that on an earlier visit to this area, there was a great herd of swine not far from where Jesus was ministering. Jesus was met by a severely disturbed, demon-possessed man, and he sent the demons out of the man into the swine, and they ran down the hill and drowned in the sea. The swine, pigs, were an unclean animal according to the law of Moses. In areas where Jewish people made up the majority of the population, there would not have been large-scale pig farming. But there was in that area, in that part of Decapolis. And that suggests that it was a Gentile region. I think we can safely assume that many, if not most, of the people who made up the multitude that Mark refers to in chapter 8, verse 1, were Gentiles. But it's not just the location that indicates this. There are other clues. And for time's sake, I'll mention just one. Please go over now to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 15. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 15. In his account of the days immediately before this miracle, Matthew says this. Matthew chapter 15 verses 30 and 31. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. That's an interesting expression, isn't it? They glorified the God of Israel. If this multitude had been made up of mainly Jewish people, wouldn't Matthew simply have said, and they glorified God? That he says, and they glorified the God of Israel, suggests that the God they glorified wasn't their God. It suggests that they were Gentiles, they were Greeks, they were pagans. And an ordinary reading of the text indicates that these were the same people, the same multitude, Matthew mentions in the next verse, verse 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. And then we have Matthew's account. 
of the feeding of the 4,000. During this season of his ministry, whether it was just a few days or a few weeks, Jesus was engaging with Gentiles. In the region of Tyre and Sidon, where Jesus healed a Canaanite woman, and then in Decapolis. We know that Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We know he had come in fulfillment of the promises made to Israel. We know he was and he is Israel's Messiah, Israel's King, and we know he will fulfill all of the kingdom promises in the Old Testament. But we're also supposed to recognise that Jesus had a heart for the Gentiles too. He had come to save his people from their sins. And he had come to give his life for the whole world. Behold, said John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now the disciples didn't understand this until after Pentecost and The book of Acts shows us how their eyes and their hearts were opened. But Jesus himself referred to this when he was with them, that the Gentiles were included in his saving work. For example, he said in John chapter 10, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The other sheep is a reference to the Gentiles. And then after his resurrection, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. This is why Jesus performed this miracle. This is why Matthew and Mark recorded it. That's the significance. Jesus fed 5,000 in Galilee who were mostly Jews. And he fed 4,000 in Decapolis who were mostly Gentiles. We're supposed to see in this miracle, Jesus' heart, his love, his concern for the nations. He was reaching out to the strangers, to those who were, in a sense, the furthest away from God and from the promises and from salvation. He was pointing his disciples and pointing us to the truth that he is the saviour of the world. That's the context for this miracle. And it magnifies the love of Jesus. When Jesus said, I have compassion on the multitude, the multitude was made up of men and women who were not like him. Men and women who were looked down upon by many in Jewish society. This multitude was made up of men and women who were estranged from the true God. Men and women who were totally lost in the darkness of sin. I want to draw your attention to just three things that we see in Mark's account. And the first is really simple. Notice what Jesus was concerned about. Look please again at verses 1 to 3. Mark chapter 8 verse 1. In those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. The divers of them came from far. Jesus was concerned that these people had nothing to eat, that they were hungry, and that if he was to send them home, they might become unwell on the road. Now, of course, Jesus was concerned about their spiritual well-being. He was concerned about the condition of their souls, but he was also concerned about this. He had compassion on them, and that extended to their physical health. Well being. And what struck me about this is that it is so basic. It's so ordinary, if I can put it that way. I don't know about you, but uh, this makes me think of a mother's love 
for her children. Isn't this something uh, your mother was constantly concerned about? You'd come home from school or you'd come home later in the evening and she would say, uh, are you hungry? You know, have, you, have you eaten? Can I, can I make you something? There, there's food in the fridge. Make sure you eat something. That was an expression of her love for you. Her concern for you at the most basic, fundamental level. Here was Jesus, the Son of God, the Lord of glory, caring for these people at this level. And again, these were not his people. These were strangers. They were far away from God. These were people who walked in darkness, people who worshipped false gods. Now, the great English theologian J.C. Ryle puts it this way, In his thoughts on this passage, he says, Jesus knew the great majority were following him for no other motive than idle curiosity and had no claim whatsoever to be regarded as his disciples. Yet, when he saw them hungry and destitute, he pitied them. I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. The feeling heart of Jesus appears in these words. He has compassion even on those who are not his people, the faithless, the graceless, the followers of this world. He feels tenderly for them, though they know it not. What we see here is that the love and concern of our Lord Jesus extends to sinners everywhere, to all people. And that it extends to the most basic aspects of life, to the, to the difficulties that are the most human, if I can put it that way. Jesus was concerned that these people were hungry. That's really simple, but it's quite something, isn't it? Jesus had this kind of compassion in his heart for these people and he has the same compassion for us. He cares if you are hungry or hurting or sick or struggling. He really does. Jesus is in heaven this very moment and he is there in his humanity. He is there sympathising with you. You might feel small and insignificant. You might feel like your problems are so basic or so stupid or so insignificant compared to what's happening in the world or compared to what other people are dealing with. But your Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, cares. He has compassion in his heart for you. You matter to him. And what you are experiencing, what you are dealing with matters to him. This truth is there in the second part of the Apostle Peter's famous exhortation. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The nature or the extent of Jesus' compassion is the first thing I want you to pay attention to in this text and I hope you'll go from here and think about it some more. The second thing I want you to notice is the response of the disciples. Jesus shared his concerns with them and this was their reply. Verse 4, and his disciples answered him, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? In other words, how can someone feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Now, does this strike you as a bit odd? Uh, Do do you read this and think, aren't you guys forgetting something? (laughs) You know, we don't know what the disciples were thinking, but it's not unreasonable to expect that at least one or two of them might have said, yes, there are lots of them, and yes, they are hungry, but this is not a problem for you, Jesus. Why, why, Why don't you do what you did last time when we were back in Galilee? 
Possibility doesn't seem to have entered their minds, or at the very least, it wasn't raised. None of the disciples seem to have suggested this. Rather, they were flummoxed by the scale of the problem. But how can we feed all of these people out here in the wilderness? The forgetfulness of the disciples is eye-catching, isn't it? This is one of the reasons why some theologically liberal scholars consider this story to simply be a retelling of the earlier one. I mean, how could the disciples have forgotten? But this is not so out of the ordinary, is it? People forget things. Even unusual things, unusual experiences. People are forgetful. And disciples are forgetful. That's the insight for us in this part of the story. Now how often is this our undoing? We're faced with a problem, with a difficult situation, and we recognise how large it is, and we recognise our own limitations and weaknesses, We're under no illusion whatsoever about our own feebleness. But we forget how strong our Lord Jesus is. And how wise and how loving. We forget that his grace has been sufficient in the past. We forget that he has safely and successfully navigated us through some very wild storms. What a difference it would make to our present situation if we remember his past mercies. And what a difference it would make to our present situation if we remembered his past mercies. What hope that would give us. What joy, what peace. It would help us trust him, wouldn't it? We see David doing this in the Psalms. I'll give you two examples. The first is in Psalm 59. David says this, verses 16 and 17. I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defence and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defence and the God of my mercy. What the Lord had been for David in the past was cause for joy and rejoicing in the present and it served to encourage and strengthen his faith. And listen to David again in Psalm 61 verses 1 to 4. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. What God had been to David in the past encouraged David's praying in the present. It enabled him to pray in faith that the Lord would lead him and protect him. And wouldn't this help our praying? And our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ when life is hard. Wouldn't it help to remember and not forget? The forgetfulness of the disciples, that's the second thing I want you to notice and think about in this story. The third thing and the last thing for us to ponder this morning is how much food Jesus miraculously provided. Look with me please at verses 5 through 9. And he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And they said, seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Some scholars over the course of church history have seen significance in the numbers that are mentioned here and in the feeding of the 5,000. 
And there Jesus miraculously multiplied five loaves and two fishes and there were 12 baskets left over. Here he multiplied seven loaves and a few small fishes and there were seven baskets left over. I am not entirely closed off to the possibility that there is some significance to these numbers and you're welcome to look into that at your leisure. The point for our purpose this morning is in the first part of verse 8. So they did eat and were filled. So they did eat and were filled. How much food did Jesus provide for this hungry multitude? He provided enough. Enough for everyone to eat and be full. Enough for everyone to be satiated, be satisfied. Jesus completely met their need for sustenance. When they received what he provided, they were no longer hungry. And this illustrates the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? It illustrates the undeserved favour and kindness that he shows to us in many different ways. How much grace does he give us? He gives us enough for whatever it is we're dealing with. Enough to meet our needs, enough to satisfy our soul. Most of us know what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 was true for Paul and it is true for all who belong to Christ. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace, the favour and the kindness that I give to you is sufficient. This was what Jesus said to Paul and then this was what Paul said to the Christians at Philippi. He said, my God shall supply all your need." according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you need strength? Do you need wisdom? Do you need peace of mind? Do you need uplift and encouragement? Do you need joy? Do you need cleansing for your sin? Jesus holds all of this out to you in the gospel. And he holds all of this out to you in fellowship with him and in the fellowship of his people. You don't deserve it, neither do I. But he holds it out to you, all that you need. David said in Psalm 107 verses 9 and 10, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient. It is simply for us to receive. And we do that by trusting him, by drawing near to him, by having fellowship with him and with his people. Brothers and sisters, we have to meet with Jesus where he meets with us. And he meets with us in the gospel. And he meets with us in prayer and in the word. He meets with us here at church in the preaching of his word and in his supper, in the singing and in the fellowship. To receive his grace to grow, to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to be satisfied. We have to apply ourselves to these things, to the ordinary means of grace. We have to meet with Jesus where he meets with us. Now here in Mark chapter 8, Jesus was concerned that the multitude were hungry and had no food. He was concerned that they might faint along the way as they travelled home. Jesus has the same concern for us as we travel along the road to our home in heaven. He knows the road is difficult and he doesn't want us to be hungry and faint along the way. He loves us, 
He is concerned for us. That's why he graciously gives us all we need. May God bless you. and May he richly bless the preaching of his word. Amen.